Going forward, I want to let you know, of course, we are back in John, and we're going to continue in John through January, February, through March up to Easter. So we're going to be done right about Easter time, do an Easter service, and then we'll launch into a new series. But we're going to continue going through the entire book of John. This morning, as has been talked about, we are going to turn to John chapter 17. So if you have a Bible, go ahead, open it up, John 17. I'll have verses here, but it's important for you to have it in front of you as well, because you can mark it up, you can write it, you can do notes, you can look at it, you can return to it. If you're also looking for notes, there are notes available that are online. There are uh, stacks of them back there that you can take and look, because you will not remember everything. I hope that you remember something, <laughs> okay? And that's the prayer that God would speak to your heart, to your mind, give something to your spirit that you can hang on to that will help you to honor Christ and help you grow as a Christian. And so as we look to this chapter, this is Jesus's what is called the high priestly prayer. Now, if you've been with us for a while, we've been now in the upper room looking <laughs> someone's phone <laughs> looking at um, and taking time with Jesus and his disciples right before he was going to be betrayed and crucified he's been instructing them and telling them so many important things and the apostle John who was writing this gospel led by the Holy Spirit slows down to capture these words this prayer in chapter 17 is the longest recorded prayer that we have of Jesus. And in this prayer, he prays in, he's praying to his father, but he prays for himself. Then he prays secondly for his apostles, those the disciples that were there with him. And then thirdly, he extends his prayer to all who would believe in his name including each and every one of us here. This morning, we're just going to look at the first section, what Jesus prayed for himself. And I want you to put yourself in his place, and what would you pray? This is kind of his last prayer. This is for sure the last prayer with his disciples. We'll see him going away to the garden and, and praying with his father. We know about that, but this is the last prayer public prayer that he would say. What would Jesus pray? And what would you pray for yourself? I'm going to give you a hint. It has to do with glory. Jesus did not pray for strength, by the way, right here. He did not pray for perseverance. He did not pray that what he's going to go through wouldn't hurt that bad, right? He prayed for glory. So we're going to read these five verses, okay? And then we're going to go back and look at them. And I want you first to understand what glory is. It's something that we say, but we don't necessarily perhaps know what it means. We're going to talk about how glory works, and then why it matters, why it matters in your life, why it matters in all creation. We'll see key in this passage as to why God created everything, including you. So this is John 17. Picture the scene, Jesus with his apostles and after he instructed them, now he turns towards heaven and prays. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you have granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, 
glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Now, if you're paying attention, you'll recognize that in these five verses, the word glory or glorify is mentioned five times. So we have to then, to understand what Jesus was praying, understand what glory means and how something or someone is, quote, glorified. First point, the nature of glory. Glory means, by definition, praise or honor or admiration or esteeming or extolling or exalting something or someone. We do this by giving praise again and honor and admiration for something. We talk about what is good or praiseworthy about that person or thing. For example, have any of you read a review of anything, right? We love reviews, right? Amazon has reviews, right? Movies, they have reviewers who will view a film and then tell you what they think. If you buy a book, which I hope you do, they start in the front of all of these people saying really wonderful things about this book. These reviews are a sense of giving glory to the thing. For instance, if there's a great movie again, and they say, this is one of the best movies of the year. In it, we see so and so and so and so. You must go see this movie. Or if you see a review of an ice cream shop and they talk about how wonderful and creamy the flavors are and how many they are and how wonderful the staff is in the facility, they are giving it glory. If you have a sports team and you see a great sports figure, right? They make an amazing catch. This is football season. I did see some jerseys today, by the way. You talk about how incredible it was. Did you see how he jumped up and grabbed that ball and the other people were hanging over him and it should have been a penalty and it wasn't? And they scored and they won the game, right? These reviews, these people are giving glory to someone or something. It is talking about the goodness of of a thing and the glory of something is the goodness of something i want you to remember that the glory of something is the goodness of something and we certainly see this in the case of moses and we're going to go back for a second to the old testament moses asked god show me your glory do you remember this in exodus chapter 33. This is when uh, Moses went up onto the mountain and the people of God that they saw so many miracles decided that, you know what, we're going to make an idol, right? You remember this whole story if you're familiar with the Old Testament? And God <laughs> knew what was going on and God said, hey, you know what, Moses, we're going to be done with all of these people. I'm going to start over f- with you. And it's real curious, it's a little bit of a side note, that Moses says, hey, 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 if you destroy these people and start over with me, people in Egypt will say, well, he just brought them out here to kill them. It says, I am concerned about your reputation, God, with those who do not believe in you. And so Moses, as a humble man, After this interaction and God said, okay, I will continue walking with you all, Moses says, will you show me your glory? And God responded to Moses in this way. This is Exodus 33, verse 19. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. 
I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And if you continue to read a little bit farther down, this indeed happened. The Lord passed by Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. And yet he keeps people accountable as well. So God's glory is God's goodness. And if you know God, you understand that he is good. And in understanding that he is merciful and that he is gracious and he is wise and he is understanding and he is loving and he is holy and he's true. You talk about God in those terms and in so doing you glorify him by talking about his goodness. Do you understand this? Okay. God's glory is his goodness and we give God glory by knowing him. And in knowing him, we see his goodness and we praise him because he is good. So God delighted in and delights in showing his goodness to us, his character. And we know about God through his acts through his self-disclosure, like he said here, this is who I am, and also through his promises. We can know God by what is created. There are his fingerprints all over this creation, including you. It's a miracle that we can even see, that we can speak, that we can understand, that we can interact, that we have language. This was God's doing, representing him. We know specifically as he declares what is true about himself in this book we call Scripture, the Bible. We also know about God by what he does and specifically what he did through Christ. And we glorify God because who he is, what he does, and what he will do. The more you know God, the more... You glorify him because of his goodness. If you want more joy in your life, don't look to your own heart. Don't look to your circumstances. Look to God. Get to know him more. God, show me yourself. And in so doing, you will see him. And in his goodness, we return in praise or glory. God's primary purpose in creating everything is to display his glory and his goodness. Jonathan Edwards, if you know who he is, theologian, a pastor, I would encourage you to read of him and from him. He came to this conclusion as well. That the one phrase, this is a quote, the glory of God, says Jonathan Edwards, includes all that is ever spoken of in Scripture as an ultimate end of God's work. So God's glory is the purpose of God's creation. This might be Edwards' most memorable and often quoted summary of his dissertation concerning the end for which God created the world. In the final section, he argues that God's supreme end in creation is one, not many, but one point. And that this one end is best captured as the glory of God. That is, the true external expression of God's internal glory and fullness. God made the world and rules all of history to display his own glory. That's why so many of us are gladly gladly persuaded by the biblical refrain speaking reverently of 
the God-centeredness of God. The best thing that God could give you is Himself. And the best thing that we can do is to know God. That is why Jesus came. So we can know the Father. He saved us from our sins so that we would know the extent of God's love for us. This is how it was expressed. He did the miracles so that we can know God's goodness. He taught us so we can know God's ways. The end result of God's work is not your salvation, but His glory. This causes us to want to be in right relationship with Him. Because we love Him and esteem Him and praise Him and give Him glory for His goodness. I hope you see more of the goodness of God this year. You have to look for it. God puts it on display, and we have seen it in the face of Christ. I'm going to look at a couple scriptures there. But I also want you to know the number one tactic of the enemy of your soul. There is a supernatural and spiritual war that is taking place even right now for your very being. His number one, the enemy's number one tactic is to pervert the goodness of God and make you believe that God is not good. This is what we see in the opening pages of the original temptation to say, hmm, did God really say, and hmm, boy, he's holding out on you, so I don't know if you can really trust him because he really isn't that good. That lie continues to be perpetrated all the way down to this very moment. God is for God's glory. And he invites us into relationship with him. And again, that is why Christ came. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says this, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness in the beginning, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Christ came so that we would know God as God came to show us his heart. Hebrews 1, 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. You catch this, the sun, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of God's glory, which is his goodness, and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So that is why in this passage, when Jesus says the hour has come, this is the hour in which Jesus would demonstrate the extent of the heart and love of God. Giving himself for us, and he prayed, Father, the hour has come, John 17, 1. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. So let's talk about that. This is the prayer for glory. Again, Jesus was not praying for strength or endurance, he prayed one central thing, the reason he came, to bring glory to the Father. So he prayed that the Father would glorify the Son so the Son could glorify the Father. Jesus prayed saying, Father, through this final act of love and sacrifice, let my glory shine forth to the full extent of my goodness. So that I can show your goodness and glorify you. This, by the way, is a profound prayer. 
It's an incredible prayer for understanding the heart and also the goodness of God. And more than likely, you've never probably prayed this way. I haven't prayed this way until I started examining this and I asked myself the question, can we pray like this as well? I would say, yes. And this is why I would say it. This is, this is why. God, will you, this is how it comes out. God, will you shine light of what is of you in me so that others can see your work in me and give you glory? Do you understand that? Okay. This prayer is for you, but it's not about you. This is a good prayer to pray. When you get up tomorrow morning and you are heading into that day and heading into the work week for most of us, I want to encourage you to say, God, today and this day, more than saying, God, help me get up or help me be nice to my boss or help me be a good worker, whatever the normal stuff you pray, I want you to think about this and I want you to start praying this way. God, will you shine light of what in me is of you so that people will say, God is good. Will you shine through me this day so that others can see you? Does that make sense? This is what Jesus was saying, right? He was saying here, God, I want you to be glorified. And God, will you shine through me, right? 100% God. He was 100% pure. He was 100% righteous. In this final display of my purity and of my love and of your righteousness and of your mercy, God, shine this through me so that people will know you. Glorify the Son so you will be glorified. You understand what Jesus was praying here. This is... Incredible, right? This is incredible. So this is what he prayed. God, may your will be done, right? He knew it was going to be painful. He knew it was going to be difficult. He knew it was going to be excruciating. But he says, you know what? I want your glory to shine through more than my own pain and agony. I want people to understand you. So he prays for glory that people will see God's goodness and turn to him. Jesus goes on then and prays and talks more about glory. And this is the work of glory. This is how it worked out in his life. Verse 2, for you granted him, he's talking about himself, authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given them. By the way, Jesus ultimately has authority over your life. He can do what he wants. He has final say and final authority. And his goal was that God would give eternal life the Father to all, uh, God the Father will give eternal life to all those who he had given him. Now he goes on to verse 3 to explain this. Now this is eternal life. What's eternal life? That they know who? Him. This is eternal life that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So if you come to know Christ, you come to know the Father. Jesus said this time and time again, right? What you see me, you see the Father, right? If you have the Son, you have the Father. No one has the Father unless they have the Son. And so in knowing Jesus Christ, His goodness, His grace, His truth, His purity, the wisdom, all of these attributes you then decide if you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you'll have life in 
his name. Jesus understood this. And he came so that we would know the one true God. And so every time we read about Jesus calling a disciple to himself, declaring the kingdom of God, teaching the things of the Father, doing miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, correcting those who came against him and ultimately giving his life. He was displaying the goodness of God so that we would taste and know and experience God's goodness so that we would praise him. That was the point of Christ's life, and he did it to the full extent by giving his life for you. Do you understand this? The cross is about God's glory. The result is your salvation. (laughs) Knowing God. My biggest prayer for you this year is that you would see God greater and fuller and richer and truer. Let that be our prayer. And this work of glory came through the life of Christ. And God's work of glory can come through your life as well as we surrender to the goodness of God and see God's good fruit come from our life. By the way, in your heart, guess what? (laughs) It's evil. (laughs) No one is perfect. No one is even good. All have sinned, fallen way short of God's glory, which is mm -mm, the goodness of God. But God, by His grace, makes us new, gives us new life by His Holy Spirit being in us, transforming us as our mind is conformed in the image of, of the Son and transformed as we get to know God. God's goodness is seen in us. It's not from us. It's from God, but we are the containers, the vessels in which this goodness or glory is contained. Live that out. Ask God for it. Don't try to force yourself to do better. Surrender to God and say, God, I cannot. Will you do it through me by your spirit? That's the way And please do these things not so your life would be smoother. Because it might not be. Do these things because you want people to understand God's goodness so that they will glorify Him. This is how (laughs) Jesus prayed. And He continues as He prays this thing, talking about God's glory, praying that what is in him, that he would be, these things would be glorified, that, that Jesus would be glorified by the Father so that the Father, the Son would glorify the Father. He did this and gave his life for us. And then the last verse is this. This is the rest of glory. Verse 5, at the end of this prayer for himself, Jesus concludes this section, and says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Can you understand what that was like? We cannot, with our finite, limited minds, understand the perfection of God for all and from all eternity. And will stretch out to all eternity. Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit together in perfect unity, in perfect goodness, in perfect joy. Created everything. So that people would understand God's goodness. And that we would be able to bask in God's glory, which is his goodness, forever. 
Now it is marred. Now it is difficult. Now it's been polluted and perverted. But even in this shadow land, God's light shines. Through His Son, in His Word, by His Spirit, and His people, through His church, so people can understand the glory of God. And Jesus was praying, glorify me, but will you do this? The glory I had before the world began, and indeed that took place. Philippians chapter 2 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture that describes the life of of Jesus Christ. It describes this very thing. This is Philippians 2, chapter, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 5. The Apostle Paul describing Christ says, hey, I want you to think this way, right? Jesus Christ, whom through he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to. But he chose to empty himself by taking the form of a servant. <laughs> being born in the likeness of a man and being found in human form, which limited him, by the way, being found in human form, he came as a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, which we just sang about. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? To the glory of God the Father. You see this, right? This is the story of Jesus. This is with his mission. And he now lives in the full glory of the full presence of the Father. And hopefully we look to live in Him, be like Him, so we can glorify God through Him. This is the point. We praise Him in the presence of each other, and rightly we should. But you also glorify God by living in His goodness and demonstrating it to other people. It's a way to glorify God more than just singing, which is an expression. God, will you make uh, known, shine light in what your work is in me so that you will be glorified? In the end, God will make all things right and good and holy and just as we enjoy him and his goodness for all eternity. Enjoy the fullness of his creation. Enjoy the mercies and the grace of a new heaven and a new earth. This indeed is a profound prayer. And I hope and pray that you can grow and understand the goodness of God through the life of Jesus the Son. That you will, even this year, commit to say, God, show me your Glory and trust that God will show you his goodness so that you can praise him for who he is. That's why Jesus came to give glory to God. And part of that glory is believing in his promise and entrusting your life to him and committing your life to him saying, I believe that you are the very son of God. You are God incarnate and I choose to follow you because you are good and all you do is good. Most of us in this room have made that commitment. Some of us are still wondering about who Jesus is. I would encourage you to continue to investigate him. This year, I'm, I'm asking us to pray alongside Jesus. Understand that your life is about giving him glory, by the way, <laughs> reflecting his goodness. And pray, God, may people see more of you in me so that you would be glorified more and more. That's a great and great prayer. And I'm going to pray for us.
And we're going to sing and we'll conclude with a benediction after that. So God, we pray here this morning, as we are gathered here this morning, launching a young man into where you've called him to be, considering what you've done for us in the cross, receiving communion, renewing our commitment. God, as you know, we have examined this portion of this prayer. And God, I ask, Father, from your word that our minds and hearts would be refocused, be renewed, be restored. And God, I don't know what's going to happen this year. Lord. I don't. But God, I ask that for myself and for this congregation, that we will determine that regardless of what takes place, that we have decided to give you glory. And so God, I ask that you will show us your goodness this year in its various forms. And that we would see you in all things and choose to give you praise. So that the nations will be glad and that you will be praised. We love you. We trust you. We honor you. And we rest in you. In Jesus' name, amen.